welcome to session um, the parallel session part of the uh, part of the program where you've tuned in to the anticipating the future of offshore wind energy in Colombia. And I'll introduce our distinguished panelists and our moderator in um, in just a moment. So we have Claudia Inez Vasquez Suarez, energy specialist from the World Bank Group. Welcome, Claudia. We have Fergus Costello, head of market intelligence for Siemens Gamesa Renewable Energy. Fergus, welcome. Una Brosnan, offshore new markets manager for mainstream renewable power. Hi, Una. Christos Koliatsas, global director of offshore wind for UL, who hopefully will be rejoining us in a moment. We iron out his technical difficulties. And um, the, uh, we were meant to have one more, um, Javier Martinez, Subdirector of Energia Eléctrica, Electric Energy from UPME, um, who may join us in a bit. And last but not least, our moderator, Alistair Dutton, Chair of Global Offshore Wind Task Force from the Global Wind Energy Council. I'll pass it to you, Alistair, and wishing you a good discussion. Thank you very much, Emerson. Um, so you've joined the session anticipating the future for offshore wind energy in Colombia. We're going to start with a presentation uh, of about 10 minutes, and then we'll move to a panel session. So I'm going to pass to Claudia, uh, who's going to tell us about offshore wind in potential in Colombia. Claudia. Uh, thank you. Me. Thank you very much, Alistair. And uh, good afternoon, good morning for everybody, uh, depending on where you are. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. And I'd like to thank the, the organizers of the, of the event for inviting uh, the World Bank to make this uh, presentation and participate in this important panel. Um, this, uh, the slides uh, will present our uh, kind of joint work uh, between uh, ourselves, the World Bank, and our sister organization, the IFC, and we um, and, and most of the research and analysis that we do is funded by the energy and sector management programs called SMAP. Um, next, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, so what I would like to um, uh, discuss a little bit with you uh, today um, are a few updates on where do we stand in terms of global offshore wind markets. And I'm sure all of our panelists and distinguished the speakers can also you know, um, add to, to, to that. Um, we'll present some preliminary analysis of Colombia's offshore wind potential that uh, the bank, that the World Bank has done. Um, we'll try to bring some of the experience from Europe in terms of trying to understand what it takes to develop uh, offshore wind uh, in an emerging country. And uh, we'll uh, finalize with some remarks or more of some thoughts in, instead of really, um, you know, facts in terms of what needs to be done from now uh, to, let's say, the foreseeable future in, if uh, Colombia would like to develop its offshore wind potential. Next, please. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's start uh, with the update on uh, global offshore wind. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, offshore wind, you know, has grown quite uh, quickly. Um, and um, although most of the, so we're looking at the compounded annual growth rate of around 16% per year. Um, and uh, in terms of the installed capacity, we have right now around 29 gigawatt uh, operational uh, installed capacity worldwide. And although uh, a lot of the initial capacity uh, developed in Europe, notably in the UK and then Germany, uh, we can see China coming in very strongly in the offshore wind market, uh, starting from 2017. Uh, and we will see some other emerging countries, and then I will talk a little bit more about this uh, next. Next slide, please. 
And the question, of course, is why, no? Um, initially, uh, what we had seen, um, if you look at the earlier uh, prices in terms of, um, or not prices, but levelized offshore tar uh, tariffs, uh, we can see that um, offshore, wind, offshore wind was quite, um, what, relatively expensive, looking at some of the po uh, po uh, price points um, for the UK particularly. But we have seen, um, as, is, as it is in the case of more broadly renewable energy, is that prices have come down significantly. We are looking at uh, fairly competitive uh, tariffs, uh, particularly uh, around 2020 and projected to uh, remain relatively uh, competitive until 2023, 24. Uh, again, the UK uh, leading uh, a lot of that, uh, a lot of that effort, but also other European countries which have been able to benefit from these relatively low um, prices for offshore wind. Next slide, please. And the other dimension, of course, of why offshore wind is an alternative, an interesting technology for countries to develop, it's of course because there is no you know, land constraints, which can be a major obstacle in some of the countries, in some of the developing countries uh, that uh, the World Bank can, uh, works for. Um, and of course, even in uh, European countries, which are high density, of course. Um, other issue is that in many countries, um, you would find you can find a nice fit for offshore wind uh, because it's close to some of the consumption areas, and we have seen this in some of the Asian countries, new uh, new entrants in the offshore wind market, um, which of course uh, not only addresses the issue of land constraints, but also uh, can help decrease some of the uh, development of transmission infrastructure, which can also be important, uh, particularly in developing countries. Next slide, please. Um, and if we remember an earlier slide, we saw a lot of the uh, growth, recent growth uh, was in China. Um, and, you know, of course, together with the renewable energy, offshore wind comes with uh, no pollution uh, and can make a substantive and substantial contribution to the country's uh, GHG emissions target. And we see, for example, uh, the role of China in terms of the coal consumption. So it is, in fact, a way of diversification uh, from uh, morely heavily um, carbon content uh, economies. Next slide, please. Um, and what the other you know, new uh, new developments that we have been seeing even off, offshore wind in uh, deep waters. Um, so I think technology is advancing and I, it, it is advancing very quickly, despite some of the challenges uh, that we will talk about later. Next slide, please. So, I mean, this, this uh, slide tried to show not only the fact that offshore wind has been growing very uh, rapidly um, and sustainably uh, over the past few years, but also that we have been seeing some kind of diversified uh, and new countries entering this market. And uh, we have, uh, you know, ourselves in the, in the World Bank, uh, been asked by many of our client countries, developing countries, to uh, do assessments in terms of offshore wind potential and so on to assess. And I think uh, what we will be looking in the next few years is um, more countries um, looking more carefully and thinking seriously about developing this technology. Thank you. Next slide, please. 
Let's now turn a little bit um, from the international perspective into what it means for Colombia. Um, the World Bank has done an assessment of the offshore uh, wind potential for uh, the country. Um, and the, the possible potential is this, we have identified zones where the wind speed, wind speed is higher than seven meters per second. Um, and water depths of um, below 50 meters for fixed foundations and uh, lower than 1,000 meters for floating foundations. The, this preliminary analysis, and I emphasize uh, the preliminary analysis, uh, point out as a, a potential of about 31 gigawatt for fixed foundations, 78 gigawatt for floating foundation, looking at an overall potential of around uh, 109 uh, gigawatt of installed capacity in the country. Of course, this is technical potential, right? it's not the uh, uh, economic or financial, uh, economic potential. Thank you. Next, next slide, please. Looking at uh, you know larger, if we zoom out a little bit, Colombia, and we look in the region, um, we see again some interesting offshore wind potential in some of the Caribbean, uh, in the, some of the Caribbean islands, which of course are heavily dependent on fossil fuels for their electricity, uh, and comes with a fairly high cost. So again, uh, this technology, this emerging technology can come into their energy and electricity planning to try to address some of those challenges through the diversification. Um, and we can see, of course, um, fairly interesting uh, potentials if, you, if one, one looks of around 751 gigawatts, if one looks at the whole region. Thank you. Next slide, please. Okay, I will go a little bit quicker, quickly from the lessons from uh, Europe. I'm just uh, conscious of the of the time. Um, the message here is that um, you know it's it's offshore wind is not really like onshore wind. There are many other factors that needs to be taken into account, and I will just highlight three of them that are very important. Um, I think first, uh, the stakeholders are not the same. Impact is not the same, particularly on the socioeconomic issues, looking at um, you know, fishermen and so on. Uh, Geotechnical and seismic conditions are extremely important and the important barrier for entry. So I think this is uh, something that we will talk later on, but very, very important to tackle uh, to tackle very early when the country is thinking about entering the offshore wind market. Um, next slide, please. And we have many of the other challenges related, you know, to the traditional development or um, of um, renewable energy. Um, like other renewable energy, uh, what we have seen is that no size fits all. Um, there's a lot. There are many approaches to tendering, and definitely depends on the type of market that you may be looking at, uh, particularly if we're looking at developing uh, markets. Next slide, please. And uh, again, try to, I would like to underscore the issue that offshore wind really has to be adapted to the context. Um, there uh, are technical adaptation, important technical adaptation per, uh, issues that I think are more important than for um, onshore wind. Uh, environmental and social issues that I discussed and I mentioned earlier, um, different risks for avian and marine fauna are important to understand. Uh, and also in terms of social adaptation uh, to recognize which groups um, will be more impacted by offshore wind. Which, so we are talking to a different set of stakeholders here, and that needs to be understood very, very upfront before the country thinks of developing um, this technology. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. 
Thank you. Yeah, one of the, of the things that when I was showing the um, the regional uh, potential for Colombia, I think one thing that once once we could consider in this region um, is a regional project. Um, it, it is a new technology, costs are relatively high, and uh, you know the sizes of some of these uh, smaller Caribbean countries may not allow for the development of a full blown project um, at a scale that would be interesting uh, for developers and that would uh, present uh, relatively lower prices. So um, one of the aspects that we will be looking at, that the bank is looking at, is how to enhance perhaps regional cooperation for the development of offshore wind. Thank you. Next slide. Yeah, I mean, the this as other renewable energy technologies brings a lot of economic um, benefits. Um, you you improve security of supply because you reduce fuel imports. Um, there are jobs and long term, um, both in the construction, but also in the long term operational maintenance issues, local business engage. And I think Colombia is actually looking at all of these things that it, as it is developing its um, uh, new batch of uh, large scale um, renewable energy projects now. So, so many of the, of the same benefits uh, that would apply actually to um, traditional renewable energy onshore wind project. Next slide, please. One of, but, but from the policy perspective, and this is where we, um, the bank actually looks very carefully is in terms of, you know, what is it needed to actually get this uh, technology out and, and countries um, kickstarting uh, the, 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 their diversification path. Um, uh, one of the important lessons learned from the UK is the fact that uh, long-term policy is needed uh, to attract investments uh, and jobs. So, um, I mean, the long the UK and you have seen this graph where uh, prices have really come down significantly, particularly for UK projects. Um, so, to some extent, I think it's important that emerging markets, particularly if they enter this new um, this new environment, think of setting a long-term policy goals that would allow to provide investment investors with some degree of foresight in terms of what is going to be expected of the development of the technology and that is not just one off project of some relatively small size. Thank you. Next slide please. Next slide please. Okay, so what are the some of the concluding thoughts, and then we can open the discussion uh, on this on this issue. Um, I, offshore wind, you know, for some time has been like the little brother of the renewable energy. I think um, the technology has made it. Um, the, the the technologies is uh, relatively mature right now, right now. There are a lot of um, projects in many countries. And it is going into new emerging markets. Uh, that is what we are seeing in all of our on, in all of our client countries, and there is interest uh, all around the globe. Um, Colombia, uh, specifically, uh, has a fairly uh, good uh, of which uh, of offshore wind potential and excellent wind speed uh, from the preliminary assessment. So it really represents an opportunity for the country to further diversify its electricity mix. However, um, you know it does need policy uh, that would allow the, the 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 technology and the market to grow. And it must adapt to the needs of, of emerging markets such as Colombia. Next slide, please. So what are these what are these um, specific contexts? No, I think if if one thinks of Colombia and try to um, to think how can we move forward on this, um, many important uh, questions actually need to be answered by the policymakers. You know, perhaps with some inputs from the civil society and other stakeholders. Um, 
in terms of you know why why is it that the, the, that Colombia should develop uh, this technology? Uh, what impact and how is it that this technology can help create jobs and local economic benefits, um, particularly coming in from a post-COVID you know economic reactivation period? Um, where the projects should be um, and how the ocean should be used with the other or shared with the other stakeholders. These are important policy um, considerations. Um, it's particularly in the initial phases of a offshore wind program, uh, what activity should the government take responsibility for? And I mentioned earlier the issue of, um, of, of the the preliminary upstream analysis you know, on, on geo, geo, geological risks and so on. I think this is um, perhaps one of the areas that government can take to reduce the risk for investors uh, if it is going to uh, start uh, promoting this technology uh, model uh, widely. Uh, how much will it cost? Uh, because we do know that there is not a lot of experience or there is no experience in Latin America. How and how can cost be reduced, perhaps looking at the regional uh, type of projects? Um, and, and some of the uh, pitfalls, uh, next slide, please, that, uh, stake, uh, that policymakers should also um, think through uh, and which are sometimes not very comfortable discussions. Um, particularly on the environmental and social topics, um, planning, stakeholder engagement, environmental and social uh, requirements and consultations. And being a new technology, perhaps in Colombia, there are not enough precedents on how this should be done. So this will take some time. Uh, so the more important that the government and the policymakers start thinking about these issues if they, they are looking at technology seriously. Uh, affordability of early projects, uh, the scale will be very important. So how much, if one thinks of a tender, how much capacity should be tendered out? Or are we looking at a larger scale tender that will drive prices down? Or we should be looking at a more kind of pilot approach, smaller size? Uh, so that the government tries to understand, uh, the country tries to understand how technology works. Please come back to ability projects, of course, which are very particular to um, to each market. Um, and, and I think, but I think, you know, this issue, the recent experience for the uh, tendering of renewable energy projects can at least provide some, some uh, advantages um, in terms of uh, thinking through these issues. Um, and, and I really, um, the final point, you know, really benefiting local interest, industry and stakeholders. You have seen where this, um, uh, where the potential is near the La in, in, in La Guajira region. Um, and um, I think the development of onshore wind projects will provide some useful lessons learned on how is it that these projects can actually benefit the local stakeholders. Okay, thank you. Alistair? I think Alistair momentarily dropped out. Um, yes. <laughs> that, 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 that is totally fine. Um, so, I mean, maybe I'm just, uh, I can pick up until he, until he comes back. Um, we have some questions from from the audience and maybe we um, can, and I know we have Javier Martinez, welcome to you as well. Um, I'm just wondering, I mean, and there are some questions around environmental impacts of offshore wind and, and the differences between that and, um, and, and onshore. Um, perhaps we can do a little uh, till the tab beginning um, with you, Una, on, on, um, on how we can sort of clarify that for, for our audience in Colombia that um, is really just getting to grips with offshore. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 quite an interesting. There is quite, as Claudia said, there's quite a difference between onshore and offshore. Um, we need to, in the early stages, we need to look at a number of environmental factors, whether it's from um, 
looking at birds and, and mammals and looking at um, any risk impact basically within the pathway of the of the development. So we need to look at that from a desktop level and then move down to extensive surveys. Generally, the surveys we're looking at uh, gathering data in the region about two years, which is not that dissimilar from what you get in the onshore market. So there is there are a number of, of similarities, but then working in an offshore environment brings its its risk getting out there. And then obviously we need to look at things like weather windows. So it is quite an extensive um, uh, process to, to ensure we have adequate and sufficient data there to assess the, the farms. I think we also need to consider the, the maritime, the, the shipping lanes, the other users of the sea. I mean, absolutely around the country, but it could be oil, it could be shipping. As I say, fishermen is clearly one that we need to to work with. I guess the the big difference from onshore is that we, we the visual impact is generally less. I mean, unless you put it extremely close to shore. So that that's a positive benefit we have. Uh, no, that's a good point, Fergus. And you start, you began speaking about the wider stakeholder network, and you know you ask some people, and they would tell you that onshore and offshore wind are actually to be considered completely different technologies or, or, or approaches from a from a wider stakeholder perspective. Um, how do you see um, the, the, the the key differences there? Should I go first? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah go ahead. I was picking up on your on your comment. Please. Yeah. Do it. I think. I think. I mean, the clear one, the the easiest one is the is the, the different users of the sea. I think. I mean, that's very different to land. I mean, you're you're dealing with fishermen more than farmers, or you're also dealing with uh, other marine users. Defense, I think, is a good example of another user that we have to deal with in different countries. Um. Again, the shipping, it's not, it's the shipping routes and lanes that there's enough of space out there, but if that's not organized in the right way and cooperation in the right way. So those types of stakeholders are bigger for, are more important for offshore, obviously, than they are for onshore. Um, idea, another big one is the, is the cable and the, the, the offshore grid, um, which is generally quite a substantial project in itself to build. Um, and, it has some benefits over onshore in that it's probably more flexible, but on the other side, it's it's still quite a considerable investment and landing places, all of that need to be considered. Mm -hmm. I suppose one of the, the key points is talking, following on from Fergus's comments there around stakeholders, stakeholders is ensuring we get in there early and ensure we bring along all the stakeholders on the journey. And I think that's really important for Colombia in particular, if they're looking at entering into offshore wind, we need to bring the communities along in particular and make sure they understand what the processes are going to be, making sure we, we work with the governments and ensure we have a clear and concise and uh, regulatory framework and policies and a view to why we're doing this, why offshore wind. And I think that really helps get an understanding and driving the business case on why we're looking at offshore wind. Um, we've been challenged quite a bit around that in the past um, as an industry. Um, and uh, one of the biggest areas was why are you going to, to more offshore or more expensive offshore technology? Mm. And I think when you bring communities along and stakeholders along, oh, why, you know, there is a challenge on the grid or it's, you know, we've got saturation on some of the onshore um, renewables or we, we've, we're struggling to bring them to demand sites or it's simply we need to increase our demand for the for that particular mm. country. Mm. It's I can't reinforce how important it has it has been. Mm. No, thanks very much. That's a, that's a good point, Una. And I'd like to bring in um, Javier, please. And we're glad you're able to join us, um, albeit via audio. Um, Javier will respond in in Spanish. So for the panelists to hear them, I would um, ask you to just mute your hop in and listen to listen to it through the interpretation function that is um, that is in the the side chat. Um, Javier, um, over to you. I mean, um, you know, we know that there is, you know, some some quite some early interest in in offshore wind in Colombia, and um, I, I just wondered from from your perspective, I mean, could you maybe just give us a bit of the of the government's perspective as to you know why you're you're looking at offshore and and, and why you're excited about it. Hola, buenos días. Eh, quisiera confirmar si me están escuchando adecuadamente. Muy bien, Javier, perfecto. Gracias. Eh, bueno, eh, arrancaría eh, y uniría un poco con lo que acabamos de, de, de conversar. Eh, un, un breve contexto, un poco de lo que está ocurriendo o, de, o dónde estamos hoy en día, pues en Colombia tenemos 
cerca de 18 gigas eh, instalados, eh, capacidad total, de los cuales pues no tenemos sino un, un solo parque eólico pequeño de 18 megas que está, que está instalado en la Guajira. Eh, pues bueno, esto en la matriz no representa mucho, pero, pero cuando vemos un poco hacia adelante, hacia el año 2023 podemos estar hablando de, de una incorporación cercana a los 2000 megas, a los 2 gigas de, de eólica, todos estos parques eh, serían en tierra, con lo cual ya podríamos estar hablando de una participación dentro de toda la canasta eh, cercana al 9%. Cuando miramos un poco más adelante, eh, los resultados del plan de expansión nos dejan ver una participación eh, eh, superior. Eh, hacia el, nosotros el, la, la, la planificación la realizamos a 15 años y en este ejercicio, eh, los últimos ejercicios que hemos venido realizando, podemos estar hablando de unas cifras eh, en términos eólicos superiores eh, cercana a los 4.500 megavatios, 4.5 gigas. Sin embargo, seguimos viendo que, que en este horizonte eh, los proyectos serían todavía en, en tierra. Esto, ¿Esto de dónde resulta? ¿Por qué sale de, de esta manera? Son los ejercicios eh, que trabajamos donde optimizamos costos de inversión y operación. Eh, en los cuales pues, eh, los costos de, de, de inversión en un principio de, de la eólica offshore son un poco mayores y, y pues con base en eso seguimos haciendo análisis eh, para poder determinar y poder identificar en qué momento ya empieza a, a verse bajo esta metodología eh, de una forma más interesante. En los ejercicios de muy largo plazo que hemos venido realizando ya empiezan a aparecer, eh, ya empieza a aparecer y empieza a verse eh, el modelo empieza a haber un, un interés en desarrollar o en incorporar más bien en el sistema los eh, desarrollos eh, eólicos. En cantidades no quisiera en este momento, digamos, como adelantar o atreverme a, a decir cifras, pero ya los empezamos a ver, es decir, en un horizonte de muy largo plazo. Sin embargo, todos sabemos pues, que, que finalmente esto se trata de un mercado donde el desarrollo de la y, y, y pues no necesariamente se tiene que dar a través del resultado. No necesariamente eh, los desarrollos se van dando, eh, está la industria, están los generadores, eh, quienes conocen, quienes saben, eh, exploran el mercado, miran qué puede estar eh, ocurriendo y toman sus decisiones. Eh, bien saben, tal, seguramente los que han escuchado mecanismos que tratan de, de que se den... Eh, el ingreso de la generación por diferentes tipos. El año pasado, en 2019, se realizaron dos subastas con propósitos muy diferentes, pero ingresaron proyectos que participaron en ambas eh, subastas. Hoy por hoy, en el registro de proyectos, eh, que es en nuestro listado de iniciativas, no de proyectos que se vayan a materializar necesariamente, pero en el listado de iniciativas, tenemos un proyecto, una iniciativa eh, eólica de eólicas, eh, offshore por 200 megavatios y, y esperamos que pronto sean muchos más. Muchas gracias, Javier. Um, Alistair, ok, I'll, I'll, I will pass it back to you. That was Javier giving us a bit of a rundown of the Colombian government's interest in, in offshore wind. So, if ok with you, I'll pass it back over. Sorry, Jason. I'm having a little bit of difficulty getting the two different sound systems working. So, sure. If you can hear us now, um, I'm happy to hand, hand back over to you following Javier's um, comments about the um, Colombian government's interest in, in offshore wind. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Um, can I ask uh, Una? What excites you about offshore winds in Colombia? Um, I suppose it's. I suppose coming from the early days and being involved in 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 the Scotland um, projects in particular, I am I'm really excited for any workforce or particularly young folk getting involved in this industry. We're seeing an explosion of it um, globally, and the interest is amazing. And there's a real opportunity for people to diversify their skills and come across into um, uh, into offshore wind. And I've seen the benefits of, of that happening 
in the UK. And I suppose with especially at the economic downturn in the oil and gas side, and I'm aware that Colombia has uh, resources on that side, there may be um, a good opportunity there for Colombian folk to um, move across and diversify their skills into another sector. Uh, and looking at the interest there. And Claudia's um, pr uh, presentation, uh, the reference to a cluster type approach, it not just opens up um, a, a market in Colombia, it looks at a wider a wider um, supply chain approach and, and a real opportunity, I suppose, for Colombia to step into. So excited to see how this develops going forward. But really, I think this is something um, I would strongly advise um, supply chain and stakeholders to really have a look at what ha what has happened in Europe and, and really take on those lessons learned, but equally look at the opportunities there. I think I think clearly Colombia also has a, an advantage or could have an advantage about being the first mover in the region. Um, I mean, we don't have much offshore wind, and we don't have any offshore wind in, let's say, South South America. So I think that first advantage is a, could be really interesting for Colombia in the next few years. And the technology took me offline for a bit. Did you get a chance to introduce yourselves? Not fully, I don't yeah. think, but. I we're probably good to go, I'd say. Okay, you're happy to press on. Fine. Yeah. Um, so, um, Claudia, uh, in terms of finance for the offshore wind sector, what's what are the issues that need to be resolved to finance offshore wind? I think that um, the recent experience with the other renewable energy projects in Colombia has demonstrated the depth of the of the financial sector to to you know come to go to the to what to provide what is needed um, for the development of a renewable energy project. The difference with offshore wind will be higher risks. You know the the the, the, the incremental risks that developers and financiers will have to take um, with the introduction of this newer technology. And I think that this is exactly where you know, public policy and the government, uh, if they take a like, longer term view, uh, can help bring some of these or reduce some of, or mitigate some of those risks. Um, so um, good environmental and social assessments, um, Consul prior consultations um, each, uh, to ensure that there will be no bottlenecks. I think Colombia will also be able to build on significantly, particularly if you're looking at the larger scale development of offshore wind in La Guajira, the country will be able to build on, you know, all the, um, on the normal, but, you know, daunting uh, logistical challenges that many of the, develop the developers for onshore wind are now facing in terms of ports, infrastructure, and permits, and so on. Um, so um, that I think, if channeled correctly, uh, that should be able to help uh, mitigate and reduce some of those risks. I'm not as worried about the depth of the financial sector. I think it has demonstrated that in a country that of like Colombia, it can, um, uh, you know, be there uh, when it's needed. I think the question really is for 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 government, particularly and for policymakers, to uh, to reduce the incremental risk for this new technology so that the prices are really competitive. Um, I think that it, it, that really is the, the, the challenge. Thanks. Very much. And Javier, um, we've seen elsewhere in the world that offshore wind creates tens of thousands of jobs and billions of inward investment. How does the um, Colombian government view that opportunity? Bueno, si, si entendí bien eh, la pregunta, eh, nosotros, eh, digamos, hemos tra trabajado de, de dos maneras. Uno, eh, tratando de dar las señales de lo que viene a nivel de, de inversión, eh, de lo que se requiere, de lo que el país en general requiere, de lo que puede ser el, el mix que, que se puede dar y se puede necesitar para abastecer adecuadamente la demanda y cumplir todos los eh, criterios desde el punto de vista energético y ambiental mm, eh, ha sido digamos un desarrollo muy libre eh, la, el ingreso de los proyectos sin embargo desde, desde el gobierno nacional eh, se ha promovido 
que todas las nuevas tecnologías vayan ingresando y todas las nuevas fuentes eh, vayan ingresando. Eh, parte de esto fue la realización de una subasta eh, el, año, el año anterior y frente a las nuevas tecnologías eh, y nuevas fuentes se ha venido trabajando a nivel investigativo, eh, uno, identificando nuevas fuentes y dos, ya sobre casos particulares eh, como por ejemplo eh, el, el tema de la eólica offshore que, que pues de todas maneras hoy en día es muy importante y grande y hay grandes desarrollos en el, en el, en el mundo eh, pues para Colombia es, es algo totalmente eh, inexplorado eh, y eso nos lleva a, a, a hacer trabajos en diferentes ámbitos desde lo técnico, desde lo que... Eh, viene siendo el desarrollo mismo de la, de la tecnología como tal, pero todo lo que está detrás de ello también, por ejemplo, la, la, todo lo que tiene que ver con los trámites, con los permisos, con adecuar todo lo que se requiere para que eh, esta, esta tecnología eh, ingrese y cuando eh, se tomen las decisiones de, de, de ingreso, pues todo eh, ese camino ya esté eh, cursado, ya, lo, la, ya, ya tengamos... Eh, soluciones y quien llegue a instalar una planta no, no tenga que, que estar preguntando qué debe hacer, sino que ya sepamos qué es lo que se tiene que, que realizar. Eh, frente a eso venimos trabajando como, como gobierno, venimos trabajando eh, en la hoja de ruta eh, de, 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 de todo el trabajo que se viene, digamos, eh, por delante en esta materia. Thank you very much. We've got some questions coming in, and one of those asks about regulations. Um, so, question for Una: What regulatory and policy changes are needed in Colombia to facilitate offshore wind? Yeah, it's a very good question, Alistair. I, I suppose, and what attracts and and what what longevity we can get for um, Colombia developing a sector regulatory policy is absolutely crucial making sure that the the industry has clear route to market is the first one and it has defined targets and and it gives confidence then to stakeholders that they can make secure investments that there is going to be a pipeline there is a pathway to realizing that pipeline and ensuring they have a strong route to, to market I suppose working with the various stakeholders as well to make sure that they can over, overcome the barrier. So early collaboration again with um, all parties is, is essential to ensure that we've got the right mechanisms built into those regulatory processes. Thank you. Well, Fergus, um, we've got a question about the capex and opex costs for offshore wind in Colombia. The question asks whether the World Bank has made any forecasts. Well, I can say they haven't because I'm also lead consultant to the World Bank program. But the World Bank is intending to do a roadmap study in Colombia. Um, but before that happens, maybe you could answer at least the question of um, how much capex and opex uh, is involved in offshore, offshore wind. You're on mute at the moment. I think maybe as, as a comparison, if we compare, we'll say onshore to offshore, I think is a good place to, to start. Um, but in, on, in onshore, the, the wind turbine itself is maybe 70% of the capex, and the, the, we'll say the rest of the, the build is 30%. If you swap to offshore on the other side, it, the wind turbine is around 40% of the capex, whereas the remaining, that's the foundation, the cable, the substation, installation all of that is something around 50 to 60 percent so there's quite a quite a difference in, in between offshore and onshore in that manner that also obviously opens up opportunities for for a wider supply chain than just let's we'll say the oems or the traditional turbine manufacturers them to produce foundations etc um if you look at the OPEX, OPEX offshore is always more complex than onshore, given that you have weather to consider, but also you cannot just drive up to a wind turbine. You need to get a, a boat to sail out there or maybe a helicopter, but in general, it's boats. I think there's also a big opportunity here in that a lot of the times the boats we use or the people we use are some of the fishermen that are no that, that no longer want to be fishermen. They're captains of boats instead. So this is one of the areas that opens up opportunities for jobs, et cetera, um, with offshore wind. Uh, 
Um, I don't know, Alistair, it was the question about what would be the cost of offshore in Colombia as well, or? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, um, I think it, it, it's difficult to state at, at this, this, this time frame what it would be, but I think you can look to other areas around the world. So when we, I mean, offshore wind in Europe is subsidy free at this point. Um, where we will install some of the first projects in the next year or two that are completely subsidy free. When we move to new markets outside of Europe, um, what we see is that the initial projects will probably cost more. So they're not going to be cheap. But we've also seen that once you get past the initial projects that the cost can reduce very, very quickly. So I think Taiwan is a good example of that where we've gone from relatively high cost to a, a low cost pretty quickly, um, or I think what, what we would consider a reasonable cost. Very good, thank you. Um, and Claudia, um, a lot of the wind resource is right at the north of Colombia. Are there local issues to contend with for onshore cabling and substations to bring the power south? Um, so there would certainly be, no? Um, but as I mentioned, I think a lot of these, um, it's a lot of these um, resources are in a zone where we'll see a substantial development of uh, onshore wind in the next few years. So I hope uh, we will all learn um, and help uh, and think, do things more efficiently when offshore winds will come. Right? Um, I think that will be an, an important thing to 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 capture on those lessons learned um i mean the the issues around uh, you know marine environment and so on i think are important um and then you get into all of these um normal things in in terms of uh i think the, the other dimension i think will be very important for for uh you know if you look into the development of a ro roadmap for offshore wind is to see to what extent um not that that the first leg of the transmission infrastructure, but really the second leg, when you actually connect to the transmission grid, can be optimized if you're looking at the large development of onshore wind projects, right? So what the capacity that uh, needs to be built today to accommodate, I uh, I mean, uh, Javier was selling something around 2,000, gig, uh, 2000 megawatts will be installed. Okay, how much more, for example, in the next, Seven ten years. Um, will you need to accommodate? Uh, how much capacity uh, offshore wind projects could come could add to that? Uh, and how can you dimension your your transmission infrastructure for that? I think that that foresight is is important, and I think that's part of a roadmap. You know that we we have initiated some discussion with the government with. Um, to try to um, try to address some of, of these issues so that uh, you arrive to some cost efficiencies. Thank you. And hey, um, which government department awards the seabed rights to developers? Perdón, quisiera validar la pregunta. Los derechos se refieren a los, a los permisos en, en agua. ¿Están autorizaciones o en términos de derechos? Sorry, um, the, the question is, so for example, in the UK, it's the Crown Estate that awards the rights for the seabed on which the offshore wind farm is built. And in other countries, it's done by different departments. I was wondering if that's clear in Colombia. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mm, bueno, eh, hay, hay que separar un poco las, las cosas. Eh, hay que separar un poco las cosas. Hay dos mm, o tal vez tres tipos de permiso. Eh, el primero de ellos es que el tratado que los están básicamente en dos fases: la de preinversión y la de inversión. La de preinversión tiene que ver mucho con, con, la, con el conocimiento de lo que es el, el recurso, eh, el análisis de los, de los sitios exactos, eh, todo el comportamiento climático, 
eso lleva a que se tenga que hacer toda una fase de exploración y eso tiene un primer permiso de uso que es, el, eh, es con la dirección marítima eh, en Colombia, eh, lo conocemos como la DIMAR eh, y es quien otorga este permiso inicial de, de exploración. Luego de que ya se toma la decisión de, de ir a inversión o de desarrollar el, el proyecto, eh, se entra en la fase de licenciamiento ambiental eh, y, y en la fase de licenciamiento ambiental, eh, en este caso, eh, se agruparían todos los permisos que se requieren para el desarrollo de los proyectos. Eh, esto implicaría obviamente todo lo que tiene que ver con la parte biótica, etcétera, y todos los otros permisos de uso que se requieren pues, para, para el desarrollo. En este caso es un poco diferente y es algo que aunque no lo tenemos del todo claro, hay, hay algo más que explorar porque tiene una diferencia frente a proyectos, por ejemplo, de exploración como los de hidrocarburos eh, costa afuera, en los cuales el, el, la asignación de las áreas se da de, de, de una manera diferente. Entonces, pues en ese caso tenemos que validar eh, cómo se desarrollaría en este caso, dado que, eh, el, insisto, el, los proyectos de generación son de libre iniciativa, no son asignados por el gobierno nacional como tal, eh, sino que, que son desarrollos eh, que estudian los mismos, que, que, que estudia la misma industria y que lo lleva a cabo la misma industria. Entonces ahí, eh, pues sí hay algo eh, adicional que explorar. Pero en resumen, eh, el, el permiso de exploración eh, se consigue con la dirección marítima y el permiso o la viabilidad ambiental se obtiene a través de la Autoridad Nacional de de licencias ambientales. Hay otros permisos que, que están allí involucrados que tienen que ver, por ejemplo, el de la conexión. Ese de la conexión sería directamente con nosotros, con la UCME, eh, pero seguramente será un proceso clásico como se han trabajado los otros proyectos y los otros desarrollos. Y, y de pronto una, una precisión frente a unos datos que dimos hace, hace un momento. Los 2.000 megavatios de los cuales hablábamos son 2.000 megavatios que están comprometidos para ingresar al sistema eh, eh, de hoy al, al año 2023. Del año 2023 al año 2034 estamos viendo en el ejercicio de optimización eh, cerca de 4.000, 4.500 megavatios adicionales a esos 2.000. Y a partir de ese momento es donde ya empezamos a hacer un ejercicio complementario y vemos una capacidad adicional que probablemente sea eh, offshore. También habría eh, desarrollos en tierra. Era eso. Gracias. Thank you very much. Uh, we've got more questions, one particularly about environmental impact and such. So, Una, um, what are the environmental factors to be considered? In yeah, we we touched on this earlier, just when, when you were offline. Um, we went through a number of the um, the birds and mammal concerns that need to be taken into account and, and the process itself. I suppose broadening that over into maybe some of the environmental factors that come into the engineering side, um, we need to take in the wind and wave factors in particular, um, looking at strong weather events. Uh, looking at obviously seismic conditions and geotechnical conditions in particular, and all of these feed into you know your your substructures um, design. You're looking at your your turbines, your towers. Looking at the um, any scour around the um, the cables in particular, seabed movements, which may be a concern during the design, equally during the operations and maintenance side. So it is quite a, uh, an extensive um, uh, undertaking just to assess all of these and bring the ensure that we are. And to create, um addressing the concerns there, uh, looking at bringing as best practice and guidance as, that we can into the into the design and operation of the wind farm. And Fergus, um, the local supply chain opportunities in Colombia through the offshore wind chain. I'm mute again. I'm moving between platforms. Um, one of the interesting, uh, or where offshore brings a lot of interesting parts is when I go went back to a few seconds ago, I mentioned about the, let's say the BOP part of offshore is the balance of plant where you have 60% of the balance of plant is it, of the total capex is offshore related. That creates a lot of opportunities locally to contribute. Um, 
because a lot of the stuff that, that's in that is also stuff that is probably more beneficial to produce locally than it is to ship around the world. Some of it is big steel steel parts. I mean, a lot of the cabling to install, all of that. A lot of that um, infrastructure to put in place needs to be done locally and needs to use local local people. I think, of course, experts need to come in from internationally to support on that, but there will be a lot of locals involved. Similarly, with the construction of the wind turbines, again, we will we would favour having local people on 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 in the ports. In um, also in the installation, but also later in the operations phase. I mean, technicians need to be local. We can't have technicians when the wind turbine needs to be serviced flying in from, let's say, the UK uh, as an example. So this this is another place where there is opportunities for local jobs, local local people, no matter what, no matter where we put the wind farm in in a country or in which country we put it. They, they almost always need to be local. And Claudia, I think this will be the last question of the session. Um, you mentioned the Caribbean, uh, but also the wider Gulf beyond that. So what could be the role for Colombia in that wider um, market for offshore wind? Thanks, Alistair. So I think, uh, and I think Fergus um, or Una made this uh, point earlier uh, during the session is that you know, Colombia can take the first mover advantage here um, to and, and to some extent because it has a larger market and a more, de more developed market. You know, um, with a, a, a you know financially sustainable market, it can actually be kind of an anchor load for an offshore wind project. Uh, and then you can think of um, you know other countries kind of. Um, um, uh, connecting uh, and, and taking advantage of this. So um, I think that that is something that needs to be looked in uh, into um, as the country thinks to develop its um, its its roadmap. You know, it's I think it's it's an it's certainly an opportunity, particularly given the relatively high cost of fossil fuel generation that uh, some of these Caribbean countries have. I know the other country in uh, Latin America that's interested is Brazil, so I think the race is on. Um, I'm going to bring the session to a close. I'd like to thank everybody who's joined us today um, and to thank the organisers. And a big thank you to our panellists in particular. Um, it's been a fascinating discussion. We've lost a few <laughs> panellists along the way, including myself, but that's all the fun of how we do business today. Okay. So I'm going to pass, I think, to Emerson to close us out. Thank you very much, Alistair, and, and I appreciate the uh, the patience and perseverance um, with the interpretation platform. It was very important to have Mr. Javier Martinez from, from UPNE as a, as a government representative here. So I, I hope you all enjoyed the discussion, and I wanted to thank you all um, very much. We are now ready for um, the closing plenary. So I would encourage everyone to move over from the sessions area where we are now to the stage area. And we will see you very shortly with, um, with uh, Ramon Fiestas from GWEC, as well as Herman Corredor from Ser Colombia and Alfonso Blanco, Executive Director of OLADE. So once again, thank you very much and we'll see you very shortly on the stage. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, thank you.